I started an investment bank. One of the things we did was we were hired on competitive bid to be financial advisor to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, where I'd worked as an assistant secretary. And um, and I, I we we did loan sales, Alex, and they were unbelievably successful. It was during the Clinton administration, and um, but the corruption got worse and worse. Now, it, you know, it was terrible in the Bush administration. It just kept getting worse in the Clinton administration. And we were, um, a decision was made, I was part of a group of people who, who were saying, oh my goodness, um, with GATT and NAFTA, we're going we're gonna to ship all the jobs abroad, and we need to do something, or else the American people are going to be left high and dry, we're going to lose, you know, the middle class will be wiped out. How are we going to develop new skills? How are we going to pe- help people create new jobs and support small business? So we're part of a group that we're doing, working on all of that. And literally a decision was made, rather than address the real problems and help the American people jump the curve on the situation, that instead we would bubble the economy and pull massive amounts of capital and reinvest them abroad. And and So this was a conscious decision, and and you were there on the inside witnessing this. And and I'll tell you the greatest, one of the best videos I've ever seen, you can get it up on my blog at salary.com, Flash blog is Sir James Goldsmith did a speaking tour trying to stop the the GATT from being passed in the World Trade Organization to be adopted, and basically said this is the most frightening, terrifying thing. We're going to have three billion people moved off the land. We're you know massive unemployment worldwide. We're going to destroy. We're going to have massive structural unemployment in the United States. Um, he gave this interview, it's, it's up on YouTube, to Charlie Rose in 1995, and he predicts everything that's happening now. Now, remember, this man's a billionaire, very successful businessman, and basically said, look, this is the establishment against everybody else. And he said, this is going to be the most devastating, horrible thing that has ever happened to the world. It's absolutely crazy. And he lays it all out. And, and, what, you know, and so I can say the same thing. We, we were on the inside. We were working with the administration, and we knew that, that we were going to create massive unemployment. Now, here's the big secret of the work that I did when I was in Washington during that period. We created something, Alex, called Community Wizard, which was a software tool that would allow us to look at the sources and uses of government money by place, because America is just 3,100 counties. And when you look at government investment by place, what you discover is that um, – that a great deal of money is being spent to centralize economic and political power and to basically subsidize large corporations and all sorts of unproductive behavior, whether it's, you know, people on welfare all the way up to corporations on welfare. But let me give you a couple examples. We would regularly find places where where HUD was spending, this is HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, was spending $250,000 to construct or rehab an apartment building when $50,000 would buy and rehab a foreclosed single-family property. So, so we were spending four or five times what we needed to to get one. And I went to the assistant, to the person who ran that program in 1996, and said, look, you know, we could get five homes for the price of one. And they looked at me, turned bright red, and said, but how would we generate fees for our friends? Now, um, imagine, uh, if you will, imagine how many, uh, how many more people would have homes today if we weren't doing things like that. What we're watching, and it started in the, the latest phase started in 1995 with the institution of the World Trade Organization. What we're watching is a fundamental reengineering of how resources on planet Earth are, are governed. So we're moving from a model where places are governed by governments, by sovereign governments, to, to a world where resources are managed by multinational corporations under the auspices of a world government that, that is, it, you know, operates very much through the financial system and the central banking system. And if you look at the, the economic model that it's using, it's not really a new model. It's called central banking warfare. So the central banks print money, and the military makes sure that people take it. What's important to understand now, um, which is not common in, in any analysis of, of the economy, 
is that the United States and its allies have created a global taxation system. And the way it works, Alex, is we print paper, whether it's dollar bills or treasuries, and then other governments around the world or central banks around the world buy that paper and the paper goes down in value. So it's a taxation system through the balance sheet, no legislature. You know, every country in the world hasn't passed a law saying, okay, we're going to pay a 5% tithe to the United States empire every year. But in fact, that's what's happening through the currency system. And now by the devaluation, the tax is increasing. Right. The tax is increasing, and what we're watching just in the last two weeks with various people around the world squawking is they're squawking because the, the subsidy that needs to be extracted every year is greater and greater, and the pain of the taxation as the economy slows down is greater and greater. Now, let me give you an example. In Florida and Tennessee, the uh, I'm sure it's more states too, the foods we now, I live in Tennessee, 20% of our population is now on food stamps. 20% Alex. Now, um, there was a woman in Florida who, who worked all her life and then lost her job when the uh, economy went down. She got food stamps. She had problems with the food stamps, called the food stamp hotline, the customer service line, to discover that the woman she was talking to who was helping, you know, doing customer service for her food stamps worked for J.P. Morgan Chase in India. Okay? So the government is paying her not to work. At the same time, the government is paying somebody in India to do a job she could do. This doesn't make any sense because the government is paying twice. Uh, and let me let me tell you the story. In 1997, remember, I'm trying to persuade the pension funds to reinvest in America um, in, a, in a way that really could have made the pension funds tremendous amounts of money um, compared to the way they've lost money in all these frauds. So in 1997, I had a, I had a wonderful board of pension fund leaders including the president of the CalPERS, which is the largest pension fund in the country. And, um, and I gave them my presentation of how we could reinvest in America in a way that would make a lot of money for the pension funds. And the president of CalPERS looked at me and he said, you don't understand, it's too late. They've given up on the country. They're moving all the money out starting in the fall. And that was 1997. Um, and so the fall of 1997 was the beginning of federal fiscal 1998, and that's when $4 trillion, $4 trillion in 98 in the next four years went missing from the federal government. And, and we made a decision to move all the money out of the country, Alex, and we covered it up by bubbling with the housing bubble and this huge debt bubble. What is Obama all about? Well, I think Obama was somebody who was profiled. In other words, um, you know, uh, a lot of smart money said, look, we have engaged in massive financial fraud. This thing is is a bubble, and and essentially we're going to pump and dump it. But on the dump, if if we don't do something, we are really going to have trouble maintaining control. And so I think the question for them was who, you know, what kind of candidate and what kind of sort of new president could could maintain. Uh, you know, could maintain the control. Because remember, what you always want to do is present people with a style choice that makes them feel good so you don't have to give them any money. What What is happening is we're fundamentally renegotiating the relationship between labor and capital, and they needed somebody who could consolidate their position. And And what we've seen is from the time that Obama became the candidate, he has used his political credibility to in essentially make possible a $12 trillion gift to the banking system. And it's quite extraordinary, Alex, because $12 trillion is the total amount of money that the United States government has borrowed since the Revolutionary War. So that includes paying for World War II, World War I, Vietnam, and that amount of money we've gifted to the banking system. Now, that's an enormous, that's probably the most impressive political feat in the, in the history of the... There are symptoms of the fundamental problem, which is a governance problem, which is who's in charge and why are they destroying significant amounts of freedom and wealth? Because our problem in this, in this world is not that there's too much wealth. You're watching the centralization of economic control in a way that is significantly reducing wealth. Significantly reducing wealth.
Well, right. it's really funny. In the 1990s, I started a company in Washington and called Hamilton Securities Group. And coming out of the Bush administration, I said, you know, entrepreneurs are going to have to get government money out of communities, and we're going to turn this thing around. And we were putting together a plan where small business had easy access to all the information about how money worked in their place, including government contracts, which is, as you know, a big part of the economy. And they also could put together little venture funds and mutual funds for their community. Yeah, so I want to, I'm telling you about the time when I discovered how huge the opportunity was. Because I, did, I didn't understand in the 90s, Alex, until this happened, how much the system is being used to shrink wealth. In other words, you know, to keep people poor. Anyway, so, so we're doing this thing where we're, we're making software tools. We made a software tool called Community Wizard, which would allow anybody in a community to dial in and see, you know, because if we look at the, uh, the U.S. budget, we see here's how the money works in housing or military. We never see it contiguous to the areas that we vote for representation. So you never see it sources and uses of government appropriations, contracts, and credit for your congressional district, which is, of course, what you need to hold your congressman accountable. So, so anyway, so, so we, we took relational database technology and we reconfigured all the databases so that you could start to look at your money by place. And we were putting together venture funds and mutual funds for your neighborhood. So you could literally put your 401k in a pool that would invest in local businesses. And you could, in theory, you could trade and, you know, you could go to Bloomberg and see what your neighborhood was trading, trading at, in theory. So, so we're working away at this. And um, I had this smart guy. Uh, it's a Ph.D. from MIT, absolutely brilliant, sort of the smartest guy at the company. And I said, okay, let's assume that we re-engineer all the government money so that, so that we optimize total equity in the 3,100 counties, because America just breaks down into 3,100 counties. So let's say we, re- you know, we completely changed how we did the government money so that we could create as much business wealth, whether it's big companies or small companies. And he went off and did the numbers, Alex, and he came back, and I looked at him, and I said, that's impossible. That's, he was saying within a short period of time we could get a six times multiple of total equity outstanding in the country alone, let alone globally. And I, I just couldn't believe I, So I made him go back and do the numbers a couple times and dug in and, and, and did the numbers, and I realized, oh, my God. We're spending the entire federal budget in a way that totally shrinks innovation, entrepreneurship, cuts off capital to so much of the healthy economy, which is what you're seeing now in the way the credit crunch is being engineered. We're, we're shutting off money to all these different productive sectors, and if we stop doing it, the wealth could be enormous. I mean, you know, there's re- really no reason for there to be poverty at all. We have the resources. And a part of it is, you know, because you've covered this as the sort of, you know, suppression of new technology. And I was astonished. And, I, you know, for about a week, I just walked around laughing. I couldn't stop laughing because I realized, you know, there's plenty of money. There really is no problem at all. And then, of course, the Department of Justice seized our offices and stole all the databases and kept them under lock and key for six years, which is when I discovered, you know, that there really is an intentional effort to channel capital and restrict it in a way that really keeps things very much under control. And we're running the economy to achieve centralized control, not to achieve wealth. If anything, we're trying to reduce the middle class to a state of, you know, not having the wealth that that really supports freedom. Because our Constitution and our freedoms, Alex, really depend on not being, not having our digital data and our our physical bodies and our money controlled by somebody else very centrally. Pressure from above, pressure from below. We're going right back to Catherine Austin Fitz here in just a moment with her discovery that the system knew that there was almost unlimited wealth generation capacity and that they didn't want that. Instead, they wanted to go in the opposite direction towards wealth destruction. If you can simply understand the game, bring transparency and start to turn that around, the opportunities for wealth creation are absolutely phenomenal, Alex. And it's, it's just so huge that no one can even imagine how big it is. But I agree with you. If you look at our state and local government finances, let, let's start with a simple one. Let, the job engine in this country is small business. Okay, so you have great local families with great local businesses, whether they're banks or stores or other operations in your community. 
they are the job engine. They are the, the thing that's keeping your community going in many respects. And if you look at the government bank deposits, the government investments, the government contracts, the government purchases, those are going not to those great local businesses um, or, the, you know, the great businesses in the state that could it. They're going out to places like Wall Street. So I always use the example of the food stamp program here in Tennessee. We are we have counties in Tennessee, Alex, that have 25% unemployment rate. But meantime, we are outsourcing our data servicing and customer support on our state food bank, I mean, a food stamp program. Are you ready for this? To J.P. Morgan Chase in India. Trillions of dollars are spent on, on getting the matrix to look, you know, uh, Disney World has taught these guys a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, but there's a great amount of money made to to make the system look um, legitimate, you know, up to and including the lawsuit against Goldman Sachs. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. We're almost out of time. I believe it's because there's so much heat. It's civil. They can now have a three, four year investigation, give somebody a five million dollar fine, slap somebody on the wrist and use the investigation to smoke screen all the state investigations. Well, I think it's complex. I think there are multiple agendas going on, but there's no doubt about it. I think the reason this one got through is is these latest polls that show Ron Paul, even with Obama or the Tea Party representing American, most American people more than either political party. I think Washington is in real trouble, and, and Washington is trying to say, no, 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 this wasn't us, this was Wall Street, which is clearly a bunch of bunk. But coming into the election, Washington has a real problem. The Democrats have a real problem because if you look at the, the deriv, you know, Glass Steagall and the derivatives, it was all Reuben and Clinton, and we see literally Clinton in testimony, you know, this last week saying, "Oh, I was wrong to listen to Reuben and Summers," you know, he, hint, hint, the Goldman guy. <laughs> so, so you've got real. I call it the Midianite thing after the story in the Old Testament of the Midianites taking over Israel and they, they Gideon's army attacks and the Midianites jump up in the dark and kill each other. And we're literally watching the Midianites kill each other now as they start looking for scapegoats coming in the election. Welcome back. It's the first show of the new year uh, here on January 2nd, 2012. I'm your host, Alex Jones. Uh, we are uh, now joined by just an amazing analyst, Catherine Austin Fitch. She's a very successful investment advisor, managing member of Solari Investment Advisory Services and C Lane Advisory LLC. She's a successful entrepreneur, president of Hamilton Securities Group, investment bank and finance software developer. Uh, that's at the you know, top of the game. And former government official, assistant secretary of housing, federal housing commissioner, Bush one investment banker, managing director, and member of the board of Wall Street firm Dylan Reed & Co. I'm going to stop right there, but uh, you know, she definitely is the creme de la creme and just an amazing person to be able to have on to break down what's currently happening. But if you go back to interviews she did on radio 10 years ago, interviews she's done with us the last five or six, it is incredible that everything she warned about broke uh, as mainstream news uh, in the following years after it. it. It has all basically broken loose. It's all basically happened. And so I wanted to recap what this new world order is, who's behind it briefly, and then give us her view into the future of what she thinks is going to unfold. And we'll talk to her about the NDAA, uh, the situation with Iran, uh, and so much more. And of course, her website will be up on screen at solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com. Catherine, wonderful to have you with us. Alex, Happy New Year. It's great to be back. We're in the crazy 2012. I mean, off the top of your head, what do you think of 2012? What do you think is coming up this year? Actually, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist for 2012. You know, it's in one sense, we have things getting crazier and weirder because the beast is coming out of the closet. But the good news is the beast is coming out of the closet and people can start to see it and take action. So for me, it's I, I feel very good about 2012 because we're going to start to deal with the problems that we have been, you know, keeping under the ground for a very long time. Define so, uh, define that beast because there's a lot of new viewers. And then let's get into what you see that beast doing in the future. 
Well, we've had a group of people centralizing the economy and, and they've been able to stay a little bit hidden because we bubbled the economy. And now that the, the bubble is over and we're kind of in the debt trap, things have to be faced. So in fact, for the last 500 years, we've been in an economic model, which I call the central banking warfare model. It was coined by, by James Turk and the central banks print money. And then the military makes sure everybody keep, you know, takes the money and uses the money. Uh, while they access cheap natural resources. And so that model can't continue. It has to change. And, and you have a small group of people centralizing the economy who have a plan for how it's going to change. We're starting to see the outlines of that plan. Most of us don't like that plan. You know, we believe in freedom for the individual and, and, and the protection of individual and property rights. And so, you know, appalled as we are, we're now starting to act to, to, make that change. And I think what, what I'm seeing all over the world, and I know you are because you're really at the hub, is a much greater consciousness of people saying, wait a minute, you know, we don't like this. You know, what's the plan? What's our plan? So I think there needs to be a global conversation about what's going on. And, and from that will emerge ideas of something that is both decentralizing and wealth producing. So uh, and, and we're just in the middle of that birth or we're just at the beginning of that birth and i for one welcome the conversation well catherine you brought up both uh, of the first questions i was basically going to ask you and <laughs> and that is i am seeing the awakening that was already turbocharged exploding and with the signing of the national defense authorization act uh people are really waking up and apologizing to myself uh, and others now and really starting to click so people are really coming out of that trance yeah. and, and, and you mentioned that. I want you to expand on that. But also the monster is out of the closet. Why is it so out of the closet now? Why would Lindsey Graham and others in, in the Senate say, you bet it's for citizens and we want to scare you. And, and he looked like he was on drugs or something. I mean, they really are going crazy in front of everybody. Well, I think I think let's break it up. You have different groups. You have the people who are in charge. And of course, my big biggest question is who's really in charge and why are they behaving this way? But, you know, one of the things that happens when you centralize, Alex, is that once you finish centralizing, there's a whole bureaucracy in the middle you don't need anymore. And I think one of the things we're seeing from things uh, like the National Defense Authorization Act provisions this year is, you know, all the guys up and down in the middle in a highly centralized system are terribly, terribly insecure. Um, and so, you know, you, we see them passing provisions like that because they're scared. It reflects insecurity. It doesn't reflect security because, you know, right now, if the U.S. budget has a $5 trillion deficit and the, and the boomers are retiring and need their Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, how are you going to keep that going? Well, the global taxation that you need to keep the empire going is, is greater and greater force and greater and greater control. And I think what we're watching is a, is a, is a very, um, uh, you know, an, an empire which is very spread and is a very uncomfortable position to be in those middle positions. And so it's an, it's an insecure empire. And I think it's one you kind of want to, you know, it's, it's fine to comment on it, but you don't want to get in a tussle with it. No, no. In, in fact, before we would, uh, did this show tonight, I shot a special report that's going to be out tomorrow where that's my central point is they're afraid is why they did the NDAA. That's why right. they said, yeah, we'll lock up citizens. It's an attempt. You know, the fact that they're dispensing with a velvet glove shows just how weak they are. Right. Well, think about it. In 1998, when I when I saw all the early stages of what was going on, whether it was the patenting of life and control of the seed supply and um, the manipulations in the oil markets and precious metals on and on and on the housing bubble, you know, I came to the conclusion that the only way I could explain all of these disparate acts and centralization was they're planning on depopulating. And I always tell the story of a wonderful portfolio strategist from London who flew in to see me and said, you know, can I meet you in the woods? And said, he said to me, the only thing I can conclude is they're planning on significant depopulation. I can't explain these different things. And I said, well, that's very interesting because that's the only thing I can come up with. But at that point, I came to the realization that I had to be prepared to live, you know, through a period where, in fact, that might be happening. And I think, uh, I think one of the reasons they're afraid is if, as people begin to realize what they're doing with the food supply, with water, with chemtrails, whatever, and you come to that realization, you know, you can get pretty ornery. 
<laughs> and I remember when the swine flu, you know, vaccine came out, that's when I decided, okay, I'm drawing the line. That's, that's when the guns come out. And, you know, this, this is a country that's highly, um, highly armed and highly ornery. So, so you can see why being a manager who's basically implementing policies that depopulate, why you would feel very insecure against the general population right now. Well, you are always right at the zeitgeist. That's what I covered before you came on with us tonight. Record gun sales, uh, probably around 300 million. They're not sure. There was 1.5 plus million in the month of December instant checks. That's only part of gun sales is through the regular uh, system. And they estimate that the average person bought 2.1 guns. That's 3 million plus guns bought in one month. All the so-called liberals I know now realize the government isn't their friend, run by mega corporations. They've all been buying guns. And I'm not right. saying that's the answer to everything, but at an instinctive level, the people are arming to the teeth because they, and, and they had a survey out last week. Uh, they were saying, why are you buying guns? And the most common answer was co imminent collapse, social unrest, and the government's criminal. Right. So, so they've, I mean, it's really a bunch of desperate Ceausescu types like Romania up there saying, fine, we'll just arrest you all. But if they actually try to march the military and police off against the people, that's not going to go too well. Well, in fact, and I, I don't, you know, the, the one of the few groups I'm not afraid of right now is the military, because, you know, one of my questions is if things keep going the way they're going, or do we want the risk of a military coup, not because the military are being bad guys, but because the system is so irresponsible? Well, I know we've had the last two Joint Chiefs of Staff chairmen refuse to attack Iran. So now they've put Dempsey in, who sounds like he's... Uh, has a mental problem or or is a mental deficient. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean. Right, I know, mean, no, but you know, it's funny because the, if you if you look at who in the United States is a true believer in the Constitution, you know, a lot of those, a lot of that, of that loyalty to the Constitution is within the military. <laughs> so we're in a funny situation where the civil leadership is not committed to the Constitution, but a lot a lot of the people in the military are, and of course. The military, the funny thing about the military, Alex, is they have to deliver. And when the political leadership spreads them this thin, that's a very a nerve wracking position to be in because you're you're responsible for the whole thing. And make no mistake about it. You know, you bring down the dollar fast overnight and you can crash the whole globe. So um, well, let's talk about that then, because you've got the military as you know, giving more donations to Ron Paul than Obama and all the other dwarves combined on the Republican side, that's got to worry the system. So there's this paradox. They want to use the military against the people, but I do talk to the military. They are awake. That's why the, the MIAC and Homeland Security reports list the military as the, quote, number one enemy of the government. So it's very schizophrenic. <laughs> it's a bit, you know, it's a very unusual thing to talk about the military and the people being you know, aligned. And I, th I think, you know, the, the, the thing we have to understand at the heart of the whole machine is that we have a non-sustainable economic model. It's been the military's job to keep that non-sustainable economic model going. And now the fundamental issue is how do we change? And the reality is we've been centralizing in a way that, that destroys wealth. Now what we've got to do is we've got to build wealth. And, and the way to do that is to do it in a in a decentralizing way. And the challenge that the leadership has is how do you keep the old cash flows pumping along while people figure out the new? And what I'd love to do, Alex, is I'd like to talk about some of the really um, positive developments that happened in 2011, which I think are important for people to pick up on. Yeah, I want to do that. And, and then I want to look forward to, uh, because you mentioned you know, the ruling elite obviously wanting to cut off resources post-industrial world. Not, not to create a sustainable one, but just to totally basically get rid of much of the human labor because they don't need us anymore because they have machines and things. And then, you know, how you see those two things colliding. But yeah, let's talk about okay. some of the positive things that happened in 2011. Have you done any coverage of the maker movement? Uh, no, tell me about it. The maker movement is, is groups of people who are getting together and learning how to make stuff themselves. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, in fact, we had one, there's one wonderful uh, presentation. I had an open source software developer who's doing 
sort of designs for the 50 pieces of machinery you need to run any community. And of course, one of the ways that communities have been drained is by, you know, getting the way that they drain the small farmers is you get on the sort of farm equipment treadmill. And the more we can make and do our own machines, it's very positive. You know, these are things that young kids can learn to do. There's no reason why, uh, you know, somebody, um, you know, in seventh and eighth grade can't learn how to make mom's toaster. So to me, the make, make, maker movement is very exciting. The, the, the uh, emphasis on fresh food and growing your own food is just exploding. Oh, sure. You're talking about getting back to the land, true local sustainability movement. Absolutely. And people learning how to machine again and uh, a big movement to build you know, uh, right. firearms. Well, the big thing we have needed for two decades now is to, you know, right now what we're doing is we're destroying small business. What we need to do is, is build small business. And so um, one of the things I am very hopeful of is more and more people see the beasts as they are, they start to say, okay, how can I start to circulate more capital locally? So I think the shift to bank locally has been very positive. Um, but the next step then is how do we build local equity markets? You know, don't send our money to Wall Street and beg for it to come back. Let's start to circulate it locally and let's start to, to support the small businesses where we are because that's how we're going to create new jobs. And one of the things we've seen is the beginning, you're starting to see the word introduced into the lexicon of it's called advanced manufacturing. And believe it or not, with some of the developments and things like 3D printing, we could see a lot of manufacturing come on back on shore. Now, it's going to be not labor intensive, but there's no reason that small manufacturers um, in throughout America can't start to compete with much, much bigger companies. So um, robotics and advanced manufacturing can make a, a tremendous difference in the U.S. economy over the next 20 years. Now, 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 just backing up what you're saying, uh, this isn't just some fad or pie in the sky hype you're talking about. There is a no. giant movement towards organic right. farming, a giant uh -huh. movement towards uh, organic milk, a giant move towards local communities as people really figure out how fun it is to buy local, how to produce huge communities where I live, especially the middle class and upper middle class, uh, but also working class folks are getting into this. But And, and, and to prove that that's so central and is is actually where it's at the system as you know is coming in targeting amish uh, organic milk producers small manufacturers the right. system is threatened by buying locally and being self-sufficient why is this centralizing system so threatened by it well i think there are a couple reasons first of all alex agriculture the cash flows related to the to the to the production and distribution of food is an enormous part of any economy. Um, so that's number one. And so if you can consolidate that into large corporations, you can make a lot of money, but you can also, you know, it's all part of centralizing economic control. But there's another issue, and that is for many, many decades, the dollar has been the, the global reserve currency, and there's been great economic and financial benefit to everybody in America by enjoying the wealth that comes as a result of that. Now, to, to have a global reserve currency, you need to control a global asset, and that global asset has been oil. Um, and I think one of the reasons you're seeing such a move to control the, the seed supply, to patent life, to control the food supply is because if we're going to have a new global currency, we need a different asset than oil, particularly because energy technology, we know that energy technology exists that can replace fossil fuels. So if that energy technology is going to see the light of day or practical application, then, then you need something else to replace the bolster. And that's why they want to go to GMO. Right. And I think one of the reasons you, you want GMO, um, uh, you know, put aside, there may be some sort of geophysical weather issues, but that, but I think you want, that's the source of, of total control and total financial control and oil doesn't do it. And so I suspect it's eating food. Now, if you look at what that does in terms of, of centralizing the economy, it's devastating. So many small farms have been put out of business in this country, not because they're not economic or productive, because in fact, technology, Alex, should decentralize, not centralize the way it's been used. It's because of the food safety rules. And that's why this um, Christmas, our, every year we have a donation from Solari to a sort of worthy cause. Our donation was from the Consumer to Farm Legal Defense Fund because 
at the heart of freedom, um, there are a couple of legal issues which are at the heart of freedom. And one of them is absolutely defending the right of, um, of farmers and consumers to get together and eat whatever food they want. Sure, there's an all out assault against l lemonade stands, Amish farmers, people selling <laughs> tomatoes on the side of the road, as you know, uh, yeah. because it is right there at the heart. And just like 15 years ago, you couldn't find organic food on store shelves. Now it's supplanting, you know, all the toxic food, uh, or at least the establishment's trying to claim they're organic now. That shows the power of voting with our dollars. And I yes. know that that is a drum that you have beat, and you really have written detailed reports, video reports. They're all on the Solari website. And so there is hope in all of this. Uh, shifting gears into a few of the other solutions. Okay. Okay, so so I think I think circulating, uh, learning how to circulate uh, capital locally and through networks. So let's get our equity capital moving, and and let's get it possible. Let's switch the economics for a small business startup. Part of that is this advanced manufacturing. Um, I had an activist. I was in a conference in Switzerland, and one of the one of the activists told me that the Office of Naval Intelligence has hired him because they want to. Um, they expect to need. Um, in the next 10 years, 400,000 robotics engineers in America alone. So I can't under, underestimate, I just don't underestimate the importance of, of advanced manufacturing explosives. You're talking have, about the humans that work on the robots is, is going to be the next big growth area. Right, the engineers. Um, but but what, that, what that means is that um, manufacturing, very sophisticated manufacturing can be done by very small companies. So don't underestimate the opportunity for, for business and startups, you know, at a community level by understanding what's happening there and doing something about it. A lot can be brought back on shore. All right, let's shift gears back into the other area and you can finish any other solutions you'd like. Okay. But, but specifically, why do the global controllers, you said you spend a lot of time finding out who they are. A, in a nutshell, who are they? Uh, and why do they want to reduce population? Why do they want to suppress, obviously, de well, they'd have to decentralize if they wanted society to actually be healthy, but they'd rather centralize and just get rid of most people because that gives them control. I mean, that's well, my boil down, but, but I mean, who are they and what is their end game? So people understand what we're facing. Here's the $64,000 question, and I just did an interview with Daily Bill, which in fact you put up on your site, Alex, and I asked this question, who's in control? I have spent my entire life trying to figure out who's running things and why they're doing what they're doing, and I, I don't know the answer. And I don't think anybody knows the answer. I mean, I, I've dealt at higher levels of Washington and Wall Street and internationally, and I have never met, with rare exception, a person who wasn't a prisoner of the model. Why is that? And I think if, if any question needs to be asked and answered in 2012, it's that question. Because I think things are frighteningly centralized and really, we really don't understand who is control, in control. That's number one. The other thing is, you know, one of the most wonderful movies to describing that control, I think, is Eyes Wide Shut by Stanley Kubrick. And, um, you know, what, what we're describing is a group of people who have the power to act with impunity, to kill with impunity, and who literally operate and live outside and above the law. And until you understand that issue, address that issue, there are no solutions. So I think we, we need to, you know, we need to dig that out in 2012. And I don't think we know the answer. I think part of that question is understanding that the private corporations through the black budget have been able to finance advanced weaponry and technology that that most people can't fathom exists and you know they've been able to finance and build with digital technology a, a matrix a literal matrix and um and that has to be dealt with so i think that's the issue for 2012 who's really running things what is their technology what's their end game and how do we build a new alignment because i i don't think depopulation is the answer i think their global vision of, uh, you know, a carbon tax and um, and patented seed supply is, you know, it's a, it's a it is a slavery state. You know, your expression of prison planet is very prescient. And, um, you know, so so we're not planning on having a prison planet. And I think that's the discussion that's going to emerge. But it it starts with saying these guys are really that dark 
and they're really that centralized and and we need to emerge a different plan well i mean the six thousand super class is pretty heavy information uh that rothkopf the head of the the kissinger group wrote about maybe four or five years ago was the best-selling book he put out he describes it as six thousand super technocrats that know their specialties and then they basically uh, work for subsidiary corporations of the big six global mega banks. And so uh, there are the big six mega banks. You, you see a Bilderberg Group meeting out of 130 people, 65, 70 or more are Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. And from my research, it is a technocratic eugenics body that the British royalty and the Dutch royalty funded. Hitler was a spinoff of that. They had to shut down because he went too fast. And you've got these mega banks that then finance a centralization model and the cosmology excuse for just being predatory psychopaths is, well, there's too many humans. That's just kind of the, the rationale. But then they, they don't even really follow their larger plan. It, it, it's, it, it's just mainly a giant system of domination. Well, but, but let me mention a couple things, because there, there has grown up in the bubble of the last 20 years an arrogance that there wasn't before. But to the extent that I've dealt with the people in that group, I've found a great deal of enlightenment and a lot of fine people who also f felt that they were a prisoner of the system. And what I will say is that I have found the corruption to be ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And and what you see at the top level is a real fear of people at the bottom level and not believing it's possible to come into some alignment, which is also financially and economically sustainable. In other words, they don't see a way to stay in a leadership position and get us from here to there. No, so I get it. I mean, I get it. Every revolutionary is a secret aristocrat. That's their view. <laughs> they, they think that anybody who's fighting their structure just wants the power. And there, are, and there is the unwashed masses, and there are a lot of terrible people in the blue collar, white collar, you know, uh, mid and lower levels. I get all that, it, right. and, and and then so the rulers' view is we've got to go ahead and be dark and evil so we can control it because there's something ten times worse waiting if we don't. And I agree with what you just said. Humans really are individuals, but we form colony groups, and it's kind of like Kissinger talked about. It's a wild beast out of control individually there are even a lot of people in the power elite that I've talked to off record as a journalist you know they say it's off record so it is off record they don't like what's happening they're upset by it and they're saying look we're not all bad this is like a system that's self-fulfilling and so there is some tr truth to what some would say well we consume too much but then that gets co-opted as a way to just tax people and shut down basic human activity right. so and, and, and so the problem is there's always some really corrupt individual who will take any good thing you try to do and twist it for their own gain so that there's the fact that corrupt people won't ever follow any decent rules. And so they always seem to govern the decision and the worst then becomes the trailblazer in the development of the species. I mean, I'm ranting. I'm trying to answer your question. No, 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 it's good. But I think, you know, what we need in 2012 is we need power. So the, the fundamental issue is, well, since we don't know who's really in charge and why they're behaving like this, is, is, is we need to get power over our circumstance. And power starts with saying, you know something? I believe that there is a way to, to decentralize and do so in a wealth creating way. And I refuse to be part of the, the madness. So I'm gonna shift. And I, I don't control anybody else, but I do control myself. So I'm gonna become more coherent. I'm going to be I'm going to function in a way where I make my money by doing something that's both decentralized and wealth producing. And as every one of us does that and every one of us becomes more resilient and starts to make the change ourselves, that shift in consciousness, Alex, can shift everything because this is so centralized, which means if we act, you know, if we act by shifting our own behavior, our own money, our own actions, our own transactions, there's no target. They don't have a, you know, they don't have a way to shoot against us, if you will. And so a lot of the change has to come from massive cultural and financial change as we change the way we live. So simply so, put, we have to change ourselves. It's an inside job. We've got to start actually voting with our dollars, building things locally, creating, and that will build 
a parallel system. You know, the centralizers, they built their system parallel and then used government regulations and corporate largesse to transfer the old system to them. They've been waging war against a decentralized system. We just have to build new decentralized systems and they'll never be able to control it. They'll never be able to control it. If we, you know, part of it is, is taking actions among ourselves. And, and the more we can circulate money and learn to circulate money among ourselves is great. If we start to pay attention to the municipal issues, so we're gonna have to, you know, our local elections, please God, this year, we care more about our, our local elections than the federal election. Because this is a trench warfare that also has to happen at the state and local level. So, so the reality is if we're willing to shift consciousness you know, one of the things that science has shown is that our intention can change material reality. That's been proved. So, so if we're willing to shift both our consciousness, our actions, and our transactions, then, then they're too few. Now, what we need is we need them to come out of the, the closet because transparency has to, um, has to show us who they are so we can withdraw support. In my lifetime, Alex, what I have seen among my family, my friends, those around me, is they continue to support these people, and we have to decide: Are we going to, you know, are we going to support things which build up our wealth and power? Are we going to support the things that ultimately destroy our wealth and power? It's our choice, but we have to choose. Freedom is not free. Well, but but now we get down to the end game. We see that going along with the system before might short term be okay. Now, if people continue to say yes, yes, yes to this out of control hurdling juggernaut. Uh, it's going to destroy us. I mean, uh, to have them come out and say, we will secretly arrest citizens, we will torture you, we will do all of this, uh, is a wake-up call. But that's because we've gotten so deep into this. If people think the last year was crazy, I mean, I mean, how crazy is the next year going to get? Right. Although, you know, I'm not... I'm not particularly concerned about the FEMA camps or, or being targeted or any of those things, because if you look at how spread their resources are, you know, these are people who are spread enormously thin. And so, you know, and I come, but that's why I come back to what is decentralizing and wealth building. It's hard for me to imagine that somebody's going to arrest you and torture you for doing community gardening. So I think what they're afraid of is real, you know, riots and violence. So I, I don't think that capacity, I think that capacity is to put the fear of God in people, not because they oh, have- Oh, I the agree with you. They, they admit the camps as they roll them out will be during the collapse for all the homeless to stay in. And then, oh, by the way, there's a stockade for troublemakers. That's in the emergency center's establishment act, exactly what we had surmised. Right. Exactly, they're not gonna just say, we're coming to get you in our black uniforms. It's gonna be, oh, we're here to help you. The army's here because things are collapsing in Illinois. Uh, in Louisiana, they have government state reps calling for troops as a way to save the public. You know, let let the system in. Uh, I totally agree with you uh, that that uh, that's how the uh, system is basically going to approach this. But they knew that as they imploded the economy, it would start causing the civil unrest. So yeah, they're afraid of it at the middle level, but the you know dark, uh, uh, you know, more sophisticated groups that are, that are organizing all of this, they know full well. Take the IMF World Bank documents that Sticklitz, you know, when he quit, suddenly mm -hmm. got released 2002. It talks about the IMF riot, how once they implode economy, that's only phase one. They want the riots to further destroy confidence. They let the public burn themselves out over six months. Then they come in as the saviors, the bankers do, and buy it up for pennies on the dollar. Well, let's look at the, how the money works, Alex. If you look at what technology can do to increase productivity, and if you look at what markets could do to unleash just productive behavior in this country, for the last 50 years, the politics has been, let's pay people off with government money so they'll, let us, so they'll go along with doing things that are not productive, okay? And, and so we have now an economy that's highly dependent on government checks. Every local county in this country is unbelievably dependent on federal government checks for activities which ultimately in aggregate are not productive and don't build an equity building, you know, wealth building economy. 
Now, if, if instead you said, look, we're going to run things based on productivity and we're going to allow, we're going to integrate technology and you know something, we're going to stop doing all the things that are destroying technology. So, I mean, productivity, if you look at the things that are making my life difficult or your life difficult as a successful entrepreneur from chemtrails being sprayed over our heads to unbelievably complex tax and regulations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so if we just take the handcuffs off, entrepreneurs can solve 90% of the problems in this country, particularly if they're allowed to use new technology. So there is no economic problem. We have a political problem. The politics are being run to shut down small business and to shut down entrepreneurship, to shut down learning by people. There, there is no economic problem. There's a political problem. That's the only problem. Well, that's we right. The monopoly men have government and mega corporations shutting down everything so they can consolidate consolidated and wrecking society. And we simply have to point out, I, I mean, in closing, look at this article right here. Uh, it says, reviving the world economy. Stand back, I'm a central banker. And it shows <laughs> a patient on the table, so I guess a famous Rembrandt, and, but, uh, but uh, now he's got defibrillators. And of course, it's, you know, the joke on the people looking at it is it's, it's a dead body. But he says, stand back, I'm a central banker. But you read the article, they imply the mega bankers are the ones that are going to fix this and that Larry Summers is going to fix it when they're the ones that got rid of Glass-Steagall. They're right. the Ponzi scheme operators who want to get everybody in debt to the stuff that they produced out of nothing. And now the whole world is held hostage, signed on to their garbage. But here they are in their own publications selling themselves as the savior. And so it's a propaganda war. We've got the truth. They've got yeah. the lies. But, but, but it, it isn't working anymore. I mean, earlier... I played a clip of Huntsman uh, putting on an ad making fun of Ron Paul mentioning that, that George Herbert Walker Bush called for a new world order. There is a new world order. I mean, they can't just ridicule us anymore. It isn't working anymore, Catherine. It's called the break it, fix it. I break it and then I fix it. Then I'm the hero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So I agree it's not working, but the, the, the first step to real solutions, Alex, is when a broad group of, of, and it's not activists who get it, it's the people on the line. Make no mistake about it, the people who run this country are the people who get the trains out, you know, the people who keep the pipelines going. It's the people who do the day-to-day -day business of operations in this country. They're on the line. The reasons the unions had such a powerful impact is they changed the rules of what was going to go down on the line. And, and what has happened in the last year is the people on the line who really run things day to day, the engineers, the doctors, the lawyers, you know, the, the, the baker, the, you know, candlestick maker. People, right. Those people have started to realize this is perverted and nuts and we need to do something. And that consciousness, when the people on the line decide, hey, wait a minute, you know, I was in Tennessee once and the head of the Tennessee firearms pointed out. Um, that the number of gun permits had just passed the number of people who were the, you know, the voting population. So, so we're talking about a change of consciousness on the line, which is very, you know, those people are very quiet and, and very, you know, they're, they're just dealing day to day, taking care of their kids, taking care of their job. When they decide to change things, they have unbelievable power. And that's what we're going to see going to impact in 2012. I agree. And here's what I hope in closing, I pray that great firearms are wonderful i'm all about the second amendment i'm all about defending ourselves if it comes down to that but i'd rather not just sit back with the guns and the ammo as like our emotional salve uh and you know that well if it ever comes to it you know i'm ready to go down a blaze of glory as you said i'd rather put the effort out now to create new industry new media new farming new communications new new cultures based on right. Liberty that will be so exciting and sexy compared right. to the automaton New World Order Borg that everybody joins us. And we're seeing that right now with Ron Paul. We're seeing right. that across the board that, that, that really we are on the right track and that's why the system is panicking. But in, in closing, I want your comment on that. What message should that send to the establishment? that this isn't intimidating people, Lindsey Graham and, and uh, 
uh, you know, people like Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman shooting their mouths off about, yeah, we'll torture citizens and snickering like, like old warlocks on the Senate floor. Th that is, the people I know, it's not scaring them. It's A, waking them up, and they're out there buying firearms. And, 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 and so I don't think, like Ceausescu in Romania, I don't think these old wicked men understand that they're only pissing people off, Catherine. Well, here's the problem. They're, you know, they're sort of one-trick ponies, and they, they keep playing their Lone Ranger trick, and it won't work. But there are younger people inside, and they're seeing the positive things go on, and, and let's hope they can find ways of aligning and supporting them, whether it's, you know, whether it's the maker movement or whether it's crowdfunding or whether it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of positive things going on. And so, it's, but it's going to be trench warfare, Alex. It's going to be fought out by getting the, the proper sheriff. It's going to be fought out at the municipality. We're going to have to get into the courts. This is trench warfare. Well, you're right. And uh, look, there's an 8.2% turnout in local county elections nationwide. And Travis oh, no. Yeah, yeah, 82 <laughs> 8 And nationally, it, it, it varies, but it's normally about 55% turnout in the presidential because they make it sexy, they push it. Because it's always been controlled. Now with Ron Paul, they're going crazy because there's an okay, actual... So, so let me give you a suggestion. If you want to shut down the New World Order, it's very it's very easy to do. 3,100 counties shut down the drug business, the illegal drug business, and the and the mortgage fraud. You know, that's that's the source of a lot of their financing. You shut that down, you shut down. It's a, it's a whole new day. No, I agree. You decriminalize drugs. Uh, you, right. you, uh, you, you know, as you said... All of this, but but I mean, my point is, if we just shifted and got 55% to get politically involved locally, then we would take things back. People complain in Austin that we have these kind of neoliberal fascists running things, but 8%, we have the 8% are voting. What do you expect? You've got to get involved, but not just vote, you've got to run for office. Yeah, but here's what I find, Alex, because they have the ability to kill and bribe with impunity, I mean, we just gave them $12 trillion. So, so what I've seen at the local level is most people can be bought off relatively cheaply or scared. And I think that's why I think this shift of consciousness is so important because it's going to have to be a group effort. It, it can't just be one guy trying to get involved and getting picked off. We're going to have to, we're ha going to have to wait to go about the local effort without getting picked off and bribed and tricked. Because the, the dirtiest game I've seen so far in this country is not the guys at the top. It's it's the local New World Order representatives enforcing, you know, no, enforcing I totally I totally agree with you. And of course, not just bribed or bought off or threatened, tricked is the key. They'll give right. somebody some little petty position that's a rubber stamp, and the average person isn't sophisticated enough to know that. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Well, so, for example, if if we can stop smart meters, that's another one. Stop smart meters. Um, because, you know, once they have a surveillance device on every home, the politics are going to change. And, you know, that's another point. The average person doesn't know. They really do track everything you do. It really yeah. is a surveillance system. Yep. Yep. That's that's the core. One of the core competitive edges of the guys who are centralizing is they have incredible intelligence on all of us that we pay for. So we pay for for all of their intelligence and database tools on tracking us and using that information to advantage themselves against us. And they have us, as you said, pay for it in the price of the cell phone, the, the power bill. It's always built as a Trojan in the device. Just like when you use Google, you think, oh, I'm getting information. No, they're getting information on you. Well, I, I suspect one of the reasons they're worried, uh, you know, that the, the provision is in the Defense Authorization Act is as, as this consciousness continues, Alex, how are they going to get people to continue to pay their taxes? Because if the government is operating significantly outside the law and we're coming into tax season on April 15th and people are really hurting, you know, that's going to be a dicey one. Uh, one of the things I would love to see on April 15th is everybody just file an extension and say, you know, we're angry. Let's see how the election goes. We're filing an extension. And that way it's an extension, but, but, but it's six months, nothing's paid. Well, you ha you still have to pay your estimates, but I think if a large group of people just did that, it would show their power. It, it would certainly it would certainly send a message. Well, look, they must be getting desperate now. They admit, yeah, we want to censor the internet with the SOPA bill. Uh, I mean, it's wild. Catherine Austin Fitz, 
Uh, what's the best website for people to visit? Solari.com slash blog is my blog. I post every day and are, we're, we're basically focused on what can help you build personal and financial wealth. All right. Solari.com. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Alex. Again, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Now, Catherine Austin Fitz uh, joins us, and I'm glad that we uh, got her on today for the balance of the hour to talk about the move towards World War III, the open move for ground troops into Libya, talk of invasions into Syria, aircraft carriers steaming into the area, all of this coming down as they openly announce a private global corporate government we will pay our carbon taxes to. And she's a former Secretary of, uh, Assistant Secretary of Housing for Federal House Commissioner under Bush One, Managing Director and member of Wall Street firm Dylan Reed & Co., uh, and she has uh, led the portfolios and investment strategy for $300 billion of financial assets and liabilities, Solari.com. And she blew the whistle on corruption more than a decade ago. And uh, she was also the president of Hamilton Securities Group, investment bank and financial software developer. She can expose the whole s s promise situation with that software. But, Catherine, am I wrong in saying we can see the acceleration? Clearly, they're pulling the trigger on, on global conflict as a smokescreen for destabilization to further consolidate wealth worldwide? Well, the, the, the great, you know, this has been going on for some time. We, we're moving into the Middle East and asserting much greater control. And part of that, Alex, is more war. And, and part of it is with the economy, so to the extent it is, you know, I hate to say this, but, but we're in a war machine and the war machine needs another war. So whether it's conquest of more markets to keep the system subsidized or more war to keep the war machinery Hey, Catherine, are you on a cell phone? Yes. Because I'm, I'm having trouble picking up exactly. Are, are you near a landline? I'm not. Okay, well, just, uh, are you on a hands-free? Yes. Can you unplug yeah, well, the hands-free? I'm, I'm, I'm not using a headset. Okay, well, uh, just try to get the receiver closer to your mouth because I want to be able to hear the important things okay. you're saying. Uh, go ahead. Start over. So, 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 Alex, the whole you know the whole planet is run with an investment model. I call it the central banking warfare model, and the, the central banks print money, and then the military makes people make it. And right now, it's in a downward spiral. It's not efficient. So, as we centralize, we choke off real market activity. You're right. Real markets work, and we're not using them. And the more centralized it becomes, the uh, you know, sort of the weaker it becomes, the more fragile it becomes, and then the more market you need. And so moving in in a much bigger way, it doesn't surprise me that Bilderbergers are talking about much more war in the Middle East. They need much more war in the Middle East, especially if you're going to keep driving up the oil price. So if you're not, if you're going to have a controlled and very high oil price, then you've got to assert control of the Middle East or you can't get there. So, you know, we've seen an effort globally to maintain a very high oil price and, and they need much more control in the Middle East if they're going to make that happen. And they need it if they're going to keep the war economy going. So um, as long as we're in this model, we're going to see more and more warfare, both economic warfare and physical warfare. It's, a, it's sort of an economic imperative. Now, it's, it's very unpleasant, but the reality is, can we change the model? And you're right. Part of changing the model is decentralizing. And right now there's you know, there's been a tremendous effort to centralize, and it's choking off entrepreneurial activity and capital to entrepreneurial activity everywhere. And, you know, one of the challenges, though, Alex, is if you look at every American's uh, household budget and if you look at their assets and their savings and their investments, we're all financing it. So, you know, most people, for example, hold tremendous amounts of money in treasury securities and and, other and you talk about ways to, to divest, to get out of their system uh, on your Solari website that's excellent. But why, why every time a global implosion starts and they're greedily consolidating wealth, but it's also endangering their system at the same time, why do these elites always try to launch new wars? Because war is good for business. In other words, war, war how did we get out of the Depression? We had World War II. So, unfortunately, we now have several generations of, of people, both leaders and, and societies, that know how to make money from war, but they don't know how to make money from peace. I mean, war is a good business, and it's, it's a way to generate business fast. And, it's, 
and to pick up natural resources cheap and to get more, you know, I hate to say, you know, for, for many, many centuries, war is war. And that's what this system knows how to do. And the question is, can, you know, can we, can we get to another system? Part of what you're watching, and we're seeing this with the, you know, the possibility of a Greek default yet again hanging over the market, is, is we have an entire generation of baby boomers in the first world who generated lots of capital, but now they're aging and, and they're ready to retire. And it's very economically attractive to abrogate those, those contracts and shift the capital out to the emerging markets or out into space, which is what they're doing. And, and they've shifted that money out, and now the boomers are ready to retire, and that, that the politics of that have to be faced. And it's a very ugly politics, and it's a very scary politics. Yeah, the and baby boomers' money... Have another war. Exactly. The baby boomers' money has been stolen, and so now we've got to go into a pure authoritarian system so they don't get too uppity uh, during that process. But I don't see things going well for the globalists, for the social engineers, and that's my big concern, Catherine, is that they're full of hubris, chutzpah, uh, whatever you want to call it, and they have the nukes, they have the military, but... Uh, and, and they're committed to holding on to power and expanding it, but you can see the collision course where it takes us uh, to to rack and ruin. I agree. I think they are having real trouble, and and they're having real trouble, Alex, because the you know implementing the various plans to let the baby boomers down, nice or hard, are not working. You know, trying to get the, an austerity program implemented in Greece. You know they're facing unbelievable pushback, and and so you have you have not only the sort of competition between the pro centralization and the pushback from everybody else, but but the other thing you've got is you've got real disagreements between the various leaderships. So the European leadership squabbling with the American leadership, and and the squabbles are very very hard to manage. And I think you know for for people to to be part of something, they need to have a, a, a real mission and vision that they share. It has to be about more than power. It has to be about more than money. It has to be part of something, you know, you all really want to be a part of and believe in. And, and they lack a vision which is really attractive and inspiring. You know, it, it, it lacks light. And so I think the chances of you know, of things falling apart because they can't hold it together are reasonably good. And, of course, that's always the risk uh, that, they, that that happens. Now, you know, I hate to tell you, if, if you really want to see a decentralized society, then we need the, the centralized society to fail. So, you know, you can't, you can't get to a success without having a failure of that which you don't want to And we've got to get in, in, in uh, prepared for the failure. It's not that we even want it to fail, or correct me if that's not your view. It's that their system is designed to consolidate and turn us into vassals while they kill us with the GMO food and, and the rest of it. And, and, and so their economic looting is a process of putting us into a servile position for our population to be reduced. It's like in James Bond movie. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. People need to really get through. <laughs> right, but remember, Alex, let me speak in your defense because I've been part of, you know, at a lower level, the leadership. And what I will say is they're grappling with a message from the American people that says, look, we just want more stuff. We want more money. We want more stuff. And we're not willing to be held accountable and live within a financially accountable model. So they've never seen a political, real political support in this country for anything that's, that's accountable, whether it's at the local or global level. But from the deep literature of the of the upper crust to the ruling class, they are obsessed with a planetary dictatorship to forcibly reduce population. They do just call us right. a disease, and it's social Darwinism. So whatever horrible things they do to us is loving for the planet at the end of the day. Because after all, you know, it's kind of like you dehumanize the Native Americans before you kill them, or you dehumanize right. the right. Arabs or, uh, before you kill them, or you dehumanize right. the Jews before you kill them in Nazi Germany. We see the same mindset being. Uh, basically pushed. Right, we, see, we, see, we see an anti-humanist mindset, but we don't just see it at the top, Alex. It's, you know, at this point, it runs throughout, 
throughout different parts of the culture. No, that so happens in any big rodent population. If they've got done studies, the rodents at a higher population start eating each other, killing each other. The rats start having wars. And you look at the general public; most of them hate each other. They're nasty. They're entitled. They're petulant. They're not excited. They're not seeing the beauty of the world. I agree with you. It's it's very very scary. So it's not just the social engineers making culture ugly. Uh, the general public, uh, uh, you, you, some of them say, good, let us have war. Let us have destruction because they're so unhappy. That's because they are decadent and haven't tasted real, real degradation. They will beg and plead right. later. Right. So the, here's the reality. If, if, you know, there are a lot of honest people in leadership positions, and what they've been taught is trying to do the right thing for the whole will only get you punished. And it's not just punished from the top, it's punished from the bottom. So that's part of the conundrum of how we get here to there. Now, what can people do? And I think the first thing is to think of law of attraction. What you want to do is you want to separate yourself out as much as possible. You want to put as many degrees of separation between you and the people who are centralizing things and also you and the people who are not productive. I mean, you, you want to limit your network. You want to limit your your work and business life to people who are positive and who get real things done. And and a lot of this is going to come because millions and millions of people, you know, I once had a friend who ran for governor in the state of Tennessee, and he said, you know, you think the snowflake is powerless until you realize if enough get together, they can shut down New York City. And the reality is the system we're watching can't succeed. And so the rest of us have got to withdraw and start, you know, and this is, comes down to thousands of incremental things to build a more self-sufficient, decentralized economy um, locally and in your networks. Everybody's different, so how it plays, you know, plays very much on where you are and, and what you're into. But you want to put as many degrees of separation between you and people who can be trusted as possible. It's just good old-fashioned common sense, and part of what we're seeing in the economy is people just withdrawing because they've had it. They realize something... You know, this is terribly unhealthy and terribly perverted. So they, you know, that's the natural recession that happens when people say, you know, I don't want to invest in this. This is too well, it's, it's all coming to a head, and uh, with all our military intel sources say they are getting ready for the big ground invasion of Libya and Syria and the whole nine yards, uh, which is what the Bilderberg Group reports uh, coming out last week confirmed. We've got a new... Uh, full data dump from the Bilderberg sources. Insider leaks uh, reveal full Bilderberg agenda on war and alternative media. And they are going to try to bring in a total authoritarian planetary system. And all of humanity needs to understand uh, that uh, these top globalists uh, are not going to give us any quarter. Okay, so let me make a prediction because the Bilderberg meeting is important. But for people based in North America... The most important meeting is coming up in the third week of July, and that's Bohemian Grove. And I know you know it's coming up, Alex, because so you've done more than anybody to bring transparency. Um, people will come to, you know, leaders will come together at the Grove. A lot of decisions will be made, including my guess is on the debt ceiling and sort of the budget deals for next year, but also currently. Um, and so and you're saying we'll see a lot of decisions at the end of July when they break up. By the way, the Washington Post had a big article today about it. I saw that. Yeah, I mentioned you. Well, it, well, it, it, it showed the um, our whole video uh, on YouTube, The Dark Secrets Inside Bohemian Grove, and it was a pretty fair piece. I mean, what does that say about the system that more and more uh, they are... Well, these, guys, these guys want to kill E3, and the way they're going to get it is to let things really uh, slow down throughout the summer. Catherine, finishing up, you're right, um, the, the, the ruling class that goes to Bilderberg, most of them also go to Bohemian Grove, and in that 15-day meeting uh, with all the male prostitutes and the, and the drugs and the alcohol, uh, a lot of the decisions do get made, so you're predicting that we'll, we'll see what's going to happen with the debt ceiling and so much more after the mainly uh, Republican leadership gets together uh, for a little uh, gay sex? Is that what you're saying, Catherine? Yeah, like my, my read is that they want another QE3. They, they, want, they want to pump the economy hard, and they're going to do that, but they want political support for it. So they're going to let us really choke during the summer. The Grove will approve a QE3, and then we'll come out, and it'll be quite a fractious fall, but one in which inflation will kick up even more. So 
Uh, I think they're working towards getting a QE3 and a deal on the on the budget to really stick with the Main Street. And I think they'll get it. So um, it, it's going to make, watch what they do at the Grove and watch what Congress does before it leaves, but right after the Grove gives them a signal. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, the website uh, for folks to uh, visit is solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com. Catherine, thank you for popping in with us to give us the latest on what's happening uh, economically. Have a great day, Alex. You too. There goes Catherine Austin Fitz, ladies and gentlemen.